All right, Psalm 44 is picking up another recurring theme that's been happening in, in the past few weeks in the Psalms. And I, I'm really looking forward to the sermon tonight because this one seems to get involved a little bit deeper than some of the other ones have along a similar concept. And a concept that's been coming up recently in the Psalms, the way they've been organized in Scripture, is one where, um, you know, just kind of questioning, like, where are you, God? Like, like, where are you at? Why, why are my enemies prevailing over me? Why are things going the way they are? And we see a, a very similar vein in this. Now, it's a slightly different perspective, and we're going to see that. And I, I, I think it's not necessarily a different perspective overall on the truth. It's just the, um, the way that it's presented in, in this scripture adds a little bit more insight than we've seen in some of the other scriptures. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from being in a situation where you might feel like God has forsaken you, God's left you, where is he at? You know, I thought you were supposed to deliver us. Um, this doesn't have that same exact feel to it. This actually has a lot more confidence in the Lord, even though you're going through some things where it may seem like God's not there with you. And that's just a real high level, right? There's a lot of verses here. We're going to get into them. But um, I, I really, I think it's a great psalm. And we're going to see as we get into this how, um, especially with some other, some other references to other scriptures on how to deal with this and yet even to expect situations like this. I mean, if you just think about it real, real quickly, before I dig into all the verses here, nobody lives a sold out Christian life and is just riding a wave of like, no one can touch you for your entire life of just God is just knocking over every single person who steps in your path from birth until death, right? It's just, that's not reality, okay? And there's reasons for that too, right? Like while we do go to the Lord, he is our defender, he is our trust, he is our shield, and he is all powerful and we can completely 100% trust in him and we should trust in him in every aspect of life there's an expectation that we need to retain and understand that while God is our defender and he is there to save us, there will still be some times where we go through difficulties and tribulations and persecutions and times where it's going to look like the enemy wins. And maybe in a short term sense or a short term perspective, they do win. Right. If you consider maybe being cast into prison, oh, the enemy prevailed. Yeah, on a real short scale, they did, right? But those are the moments where you might be questioning and going, where's God? Similar to, you know, John the Baptist, when he was cast into prison, he, and, and he said, uh, you know, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are these, are, you know, art thou the one that we're looking for? Do we look for another? Right? He, he, he doubted and had a moment of, of, of doubt because of, him being arrested and put into prison and also probably just from a false understanding of what he thought the Savior was going to do when he came the first time. And see, we as New Testament believers and, and having have all the scripture completely at our disposal and all the time to study it, it excuse me, and learn from different teachers, we've got, we've got a lot more understanding than they did back then. Going with just Old Testament knowledge you know, there's prophecies of Jesus Christ's first coming and second coming, both in Old Testament. So being able to discern between both was harder for them to do. They didn't have as much light shed on the word as we have today. So a lot of the Jews at the time that were looking for a Christ, looking for the Messiah, were looking for the Christ to come and then to set up his kingdom and, and to rule and reign. And that's what they were, a lot of them were looking for. And that's why I think John the Baptist had a, had a lapse of faith, just going like, well, wait, if, the Messiah, if he's the Messiah, and, every, you know, and at first it's great, there's all the miracles, people are getting saved, but then it's just kind of like, well, why am I in prison then? Right? Like, I th when, when are you going to set up the kingdom? You know, when, when, <laughs> when are you going to deliver us from all of our enemies and, you know, and, and, and kick Rome out of here and, get, you know, and, just, and just set up your kingdom, right? So that's, I think that's where some of the doubt came from. It's just a lack of understanding. But of course, Jesus answered them, hey, you, you know, the blind have receiving their sight, 
the deaf hear, the poor of the gospel preached unto them. You know, just, just let them know, remind them, no, I'm, I'm still the right guy, right? But he just didn't have a, a, a good understanding of, of what all is to come and what everything is going to entail. So keeping that same perspective is important for us as well. You know, that we can't, you know, life is not going to be a bed of roses. And when, por when people portray Christianity as just being like, oh man, you know, because on the one hand, it's absolutely 100% true. You know, all of your problems are solved when you go to Christ in the sense that like your worst problems are definitely solved because you're not going to go to hell anymore. And if you look at it from in comparison to every other problem you might possibly have, what else is there when you know that you're, you're saved from hell, you're saved from the punishment of your sins, and, and that you have eternal life. But on the other hand, you know, you can't take that truth and just apply it in the sense that like, well, you're not going to have any troubles or trials in this life. And, any, you know, of course you will. So we need, we need to understand that as well. And, and it's not necessarily a matter of God forsaking you when you go through hard times. But uh, there's many reasons why those things happen and why God allows them to happen. But anyways, that's all by way of introduction. It's real high level of, of all the content in this chapter. Let's dig into these verses because there's a lot of great material here. Verse number one, the Bible reads, We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days, in the times of old. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantedst them. How thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. So the psalm starts off just addressing the Lord, you know, speaking to God and saying, God, we heard about all the stories in the times past. We heard how you delivered your people out of Egypt. We, we heard the great power and might that you had and just casting out the heathen and, and, and knocking them down and planting your people in the land because you had favor to them. You know, we hear all these great stories, right? This is how they're, they're just opening up to God, just bringing up. Because what, what it's going to end up, the, the way, the path it's going, of course, is kind of where is that now, right? Like we've heard all these great stories, we know that you're able to do this. We believe and we know that you've done this. You know, we trust this. We know this is to be true. Verse 4, Thou art my king, O God. Command deliverances for Jacob. So now it's kind of going to a, pre a present tense. Hey, you're my king. I'm serving you, Lord. Command deliverances for Jacob. Free us. Deliver us. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. And I love this, this confidence and this assurance. Hey, Lord, with you with us, we're going to defeat our enemies. You can be with us. We'll, we'll you know, push them down. We're going to tread them down that rise up against us. Verse 6, for I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. He's saying, Lord, I, it's not me. We know it's not me, but we know that we can do everything when you're on our side. We're not relying on our own strength. We're not relying on our might and our arms. We're relying on you. Verse 7, But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever, Selah. Now, and this is absolutely the right attitude to have. 100%. And this is taught all throughout Scripture. Great, great, great attitude to have towards the Lord. God, you're with us. Who could be against us? God, fight our battles for us. God, we're looking to you. We know you can do this. We have faith that you can do this. We're trusting in you right now. You're our king. And we're not going to lift ourselves up and, and be so proud to think that, that we are going to defeat our enemies. We know that you'll do it for us. And, and we're going to just have our boasting of you all the day long. And, you know, this is, a, this is the exact attitude that King David had. Remember when he was younger... He didn't trust in his own flesh and his own might to go off and slay the giant. He wasn't trusting that he was just so mighty and powerful that he could beat this Philistine and I could, you know, he's been a warrior for so long, but you know what? I did my special training and I was out, you know, that's not what he was trusting in. He was just like, Lord, I know that you can, you can beat even this guy who's making everybody to, to tremble and fear but God, I know you could use me. I'm willing. Here I am. 
use me and, and have the confidence of just being able. And that's why I love one of the things I love about that story is when you read that story, it says that David ran to meet Goliath. He didn't stumble, drag his feet. I mean, he ran. He had full confidence. He knew that God was with him. And this is, this is the confidence being given here. And this is a confidence that we ought to have as well. Look at verse number nine, though. And this is where it transitions from, you know, highlighting all of that, that great goodness, the great history, and the confidence in the Lord, saying in verse nine, but thou hast cast us off and put us to shame and goest not forth with our armies. So now they're saying, but this is what's happened, God. You know, you're our king. We're trusting in you. We know you can do this, but you've cast us off. You know, we go to battle, we're, we're being put to shame. You're not with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy, and they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat. Basically, you're saying we're being slaughtered. And hast scattered us among the heathen. Thou sellest thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. So nothing's going their way here, right? It's, it, I mean, they're in, they're having all kinds of trouble. Now, one of the reasons why I think this is extremely important for us to understand here as well is that this is also going to be the way that it is in the end times when Christians are being martyred and slaughtered and the heathen is going to you know, have the, the, the Christians in reproach, right? They're going to be disdaining them. They're going to be a scorn and derision to them that are around about us. They're going to be a byword. They're going to be the ones that are cast down. We are. The, the Christians are going to be, right? And, and the God-haters are going to be prevailing over believers at that time. Because the Bible says, unless those days should be shortened, Right, that basically all flesh was going to be destroyed. That no, that no one was, no flesh was going to be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days are shortened, and that God and Jesus will come back prior to everybody just being exterminated by the Antichrist. Every believer, right? That's his goal, and that's what he's going to be doing. And when and when the new world order is completely fully set up, and the Antichrist is in power, he's going to be winning. And again, in the short-term sense, in the sense of just the battle that would be going on at the moment and people physically dying, but obviously the victory is going to belong unto the Lord. And we know the end of things, so there's no reason to get discouraged. However, you may find yourself, if we are alive during that time, and I, and I think there's a good possibility we will be, if we find ourselves alive, we need to remember Psalm 44. We need to keep the confidence of verses 1 through 8 and know that God is completely able and capable and with us and can do this, but also know that even though you may be doing everything right, you could still find yourself in a situation like verses 9 through 16. You can still find yourself there. And it doesn't mean God's not able to deliver. and It doesn't mean that, that God has forsaken you. It doesn't mean those things. There could be other meanings behind what is going on. Think about this. Turn, turn if you would, to Isaiah 53. And what's interesting about this, and, when, and we kind of read over pretty quick, but I mean, I think you get the idea of verses 9 through 16. Being chased by your enemies, having confusion, being reproached by, the, by blasphemers. And, and having the heathen kind of ruling over you, those are all things that will, that will come upon people who are cursed of God. Are they not? I mean, those are, th these things that we read, the Bible even warns that those are curses. Hey, if you forsake the Lord and you go and serve other gods, these are going to be the types of things that you'll experience. And this is also important to remember because... From an outsider looking in, you may not know why 
a certain people or you know, an individual is going through a lot of things. And, and on the one hand, it looks like, hey, they might have just forsaken God. That's why they're having all of these problems. But in the, in the context of what we're reading here, these people didn't forsake God. They have the right heart. They have the right attitude. They are serving the Lord, yet they're still experiencing these things. So number one, this, is, this should ought to teach us that you, know, you can't always judge a book by its cover. You need to know the heart of the matter to understand the proper judgment on why these things are even happening. And we have plenty of examples in Scripture of that. And the first one that we're going to look at is just Jesus Christ himself. Right? Jesus Christ was cursed. The end of his life. But why was he cursed? Was he cursed because he forsook the Father? No. Was he cursed because of some sin that he had? No. He was cursed for our sakes. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. So when, you, when people looked on him, they would wag their heads, shake their heads. He became a reproach. People were blaspheming. All the things that we're reading about here in Psalm 44... Were, were things that you could have said about Jesus Christ. And we'll see this here, you know, when he, when he came unto his own and he was rejected, and his enemies, you know, you can say they prevailed over him, right? Because they, they, they executed him. But they didn't really prevail. They prevailed in their own eyes, right? The world might look at that as, as a victory, but we know that wasn't a victory. Jesus has a victory. They thought they had the victory, and he resurrected from the dead. Okay, and he conquered death and hell. So the victory belongs to Jesus Christ, not to them. But, but on, on, in the middle of it, prior to the resurrection, right, going through all that, it looks really bad. I mean, even Jesus Christ himself hanging up on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, right? being in that darkest hour and that moment where things are really just not going well at all. And look at Isaiah 53. is a great uh, prophecy of Jesus Christ himself and gives us some insight into what he went through. Look at verse number 4 of Isaiah 53. The Bible reads, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So he's saying, he's carrying our sorrows, he's carrying our griefs, and we just we look down on him and consider him as being, you know, smitten of God. Oh yeah, God must not be pleased with him. He's, he's smitten of God, he's stricken, he's afflicted because of stuff that he did. This is how the world and many people viewed Jesus Christ. He came here to take your grief and your sorrow, and yet you're just looking down on him and despising him as if he did something wrong. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And, you know, you can't help but see the correlation here with the verse, um, talking about verse 11 in Psalm 44, thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat and has scattered us among the heathen, right? Uh, and we're going to get into at the end of the chapter as well where, the, where that's brought up in Romans. Um, another similar passage, but just this concept of just being like sheep for the slaughter, right? And this is exactly how Jesus Christ is being described when he was brought before Herod and, and brought before Pilate and was condemned to death, right? Where it says, he is brought as a, a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And even to the point of his death, right? He's, he's being crucified with these thieves. He, he's make, they're making his grave with the wicked. 
as if he's just like these other wicked people. And he's not, right? So you, you compare all of that with what we see in Psalm 44 and then remember, hey, Jesus Christ went through these things. And he did everything right. Everything right. So if, if he ends up going through time, a, test, a, a very severe time of persecution and, and anguish and you know, trouble and everyone turning on him and everything going wrong and being beaten up and whipped to the point of being put to death, don't think that you know, God's just left you or you don't have good favor or good standing with God because you go through those things. Don't think that God's not capable of delivering you. Jesus Christ even said, you know, I, he's, he's able to ask of his father and his father would give him, you know, 12 legions of angels to defend him. When he, you know, that was before he was getting arrested. Hey, we got this. It's no problem. It's not that there's a lack of confidence in the Lord, but this must be done. And there's times in our lives where we may have to go through things that are, that are not comfortable, that are going to be down times, there are going to be times of bad things happening, but there's a greater good that we may not even be fully aware of. And, you know, another example, you know, Jesus Christ, of course, was martyred, but he was martyred for the purpose of the resurrection. He was martyred in order to pay for our sins. He was martyred for many reasons that ended up turning out to be great and in the end were huge victories. Another example is, is the martyr Stephen, who, you know, his life, you could say, it ended way too soon. What a great man of God. He was full of the Holy Ghost and power and, and wisdom and, and he did a lot of great things and, and he was, you know, he was a, a ordained to be one of those, um, I believe, a, 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 um, like a deacon and he was, you know, he was definitely preaching the gospel. He was doing a lot of evangelism and he had boldness and he was preaching in the power of the Spirit, yet he gets stoned to death, right? You might look at that and go, oh man, the enemy really prevailed in that one. But that act, that act of, of selflessness, that act of devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, that act of just him standing there defiantly and preaching the truth and saying, no, we're not going to bow down to any false god. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. You guys are wicked for putting him to death and just, and just preaching the truth, even if it meant his own life, had the impact on Saul of Tarsus. The young man Saul who was standing there and consented unto his death and actually went to help cover up the crime of those that actually killed him. And because, yes, it was a crime because he didn't do anything wrong. He was an innocent man that was murdered. And Saul helped cover it up. But you know what? The Bible tells us that for a reason and I believe that that moment had a big impact on Saul of Tarsus' life. Even though he didn't get saved right there, even though he didn't repent, he didn't change at that moment, that planted a seed right there of Stephen standing up and not, not accepting, you know, uh, some compromise for his own life, but just fully being devoted to the Lord. And your actions go hand in hand with your words and will make your words that much more powerful when people can see the truthfulness and the integrity that you have that goes along with what you believe, right? And your willingness to stand and not forsake the Lord and not back down and not go, oh, well, you're not here for me, God, so see ya, forget all this stuff, you know, and just, and just run and, and, and give up on the Lord just because things get a little hard for you. See, oftentimes another reason why you may end up going through our times is just to try your heart, to try you, that God wants to see, hey, what's really in your heart? It's easy for, th for everyone to say, when, when things are going great, oh yeah, praise the Lord, oh yeah, God's blessing, you know. Obviously you should be doing that, but it's a lot easier to do that when everything's going really well. But when nothing's going well, and you can still say, hey, you know what, praise the Lord. Hey, God's good. Hey, God's almighty. God's the savior. God, God is the way, the, the, you know, the truth. You got to follow the Lord and, and just maintain that integrity and that honesty. And it just, this is right. That says a lot more during those times.
and can have a lot more impact in other people's lives when you can retain that faithfulness to God. So not only is it God trying your heart, but it would also be God using you for other people's benefit that you don't have no idea about because normally when you're going through that type of stuff, you're probably thinking about yourself and all the problems you're having. You're not thinking about the people who are looking on you. Because you know what? Some of those people might even hate you and want you to be going down at the time. But you can still make the impact for their soul later on down the road. Saul was concerned. He wanted Stephen dead at that time. Stephen probably had no idea that he would have any impact on anyone else there when they're throwing rocks at him. But he maintained that faithfulness and that ended up speaking volumes uh, to his life. And, and, what, a, and what, a great, what a great accomplishment that was. I wouldn't call that a failure. If, if that really was a pivotal, the, the pivotal moment in the Apostle Paul's life that, he, that, that kind of helped steer him down the right path, and, and was instrumental in his salvation. Look at all the good that he did. Right? I mean, how would you not, would you like to not have that? Not have him serving the Lord the way that he did. We'll go back to Psalm 44. We need to remember not to be too quick to judge when bad things happen to people, especially when there doesn't seem to be a cause. Right? Sometimes you could, sometimes it's obvious. Someone just, just really, you know, gets involved in some bad sin or something and, and judgment comes. It could be very obvious and, and it's not much of a question. But don't be like Job's friends, right? When everything went wrong in Job's life. Because he is a great example of this. Everything went wrong in Job's life. I mean, he lost his children. He lost his wealth. He lost his goods. Even his wife told him, you know, dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But see, Job had the right heart. Job had the faith in the Lord that wasn't fake. It wasn't fair. He wasn't a fair weather Christian. It was real. He, he believed in God. And that's why he answered her in Job 2.10. He said, but he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? He's saying, look, we need to be ready for both. The Apostle Paul said, you know, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Therefore, in all things, whatsoever I state I am, I have learned therewith to be content. God may bless you tremendously. Hey, praise the Lord. God may bring you down to have nothing. Hey, you know what? Praise the Lord. He's good. His mercy endureth forever. Look at Psalm 44, verse 17. The Bible reads, all this has come upon us, and I love this, yet have we not forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. So even though all these things are happening, Lord, we still haven't forgotten you. We're not turning our back on you. We're not quitting. They're calling out to God, to God help us. Look, this is what's happening. We know you can do this. We're confident in you. If you're with us, we can, we can knock down any army that comes against us, but... You know, this is what's happening. We're being defeated. We're having, you know, we're having all these problems. But even through all this, Lord, you know what? We haven't given up on you. We're not just, just jumping religions and jumping boats and going and let's see how Baal can do for us now. No. We haven't forgotten you. Verse 18, our heart is not turned back. Neither of our steps declined from the way. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. So even though we've gone through all of this, it's really bad, Lord, we're still not, we're not just backing out on you. And Job did the same exact thing, right? He didn't back out on God. He's, no, he kept his faith. He retained his integrity. Verse number 20 there in Psalm 44. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of of the heart. And I want to focus on that phrase just a little bit um, as we continue on here. It's kind of a side note, but these people are confident in the Lord. 
And they're saying, look, you, you know, if we had gone to seek out some other God, you'd know a God, right? And the reason why, it says, for he knoweth the secrets of the heart. And again, just a little bit of a, of a, of a detour from the main focus of Psalm 44. Don't forget that God knows the secrets of the heart. You know, other people, you know, you could keep secrets in your heart here from other people. You could keep secrets from your family members, from your spouse, from your children, from your parents, from your brother, from your sister. But God knows your heart. And not just your heart, God knows your thoughts. Okay. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Matthew 15. I'm going to read from 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. This is David instructing Solomon, his son. He says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. He's saying, you know what, Solomon? Because Solomon is inheriting a lot. And I would say this is very, very important for second, third, fourth generation Christians coming from a Christian home. Okay, this is probably not as common from a first generation Christian in the sense. And what I mean by that is someone who wasn't necessarily raised Christian and so, you know, someone who... Um, didn't have all of the great upbringing and the advantages that go along with being raised in a Christian home. Because the advantages of that is you're exposed to the truth a lot earlier that can help you make the right choices in your life and not necessarily have to deal with a lot of the problems and hardships that can go along with sin from people who have sinned ignorantly in their life because they didn't come to Christ earlier in their life, right? Now, obviously, there's people who commit sin even after they're saved and everything else. But in general, as, as you know, a, a general rule, when people get saved later in life and they weren't raised properly, you're going to have a lot more problems. And you're not going to forget who God is. You're not going to forget that God knows everything that you've done. You're not going to forget those things as easily but like King David, you know, Solomon's getting this whole kingdom. Solomon's getting everything. David worked real hard. David had a great relationship with the Lord. David had a great heart for the Lord. And now he's passing off the torch to Solomon, his son. And he's reminding him, you know, it's, it's not just the looks. It's not just the outward show. Because you can make everybody around you think, Oh, look how great he serves the Lord. But God knows the heart. He says, you need to serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. Not just, oh, I'm the king. I have to. I'm expected of this because my dad did this. And uh, okay, yeah, here, we're going to do this. God searches all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. That's a warning for his son, and it's important to remember that. And again, especially kids, you know, you may f have a little bit of pressure to follow in your parents' footsteps, and, you know, they're bringing you to church, and you need to keep going to church, and you understand that, and, and you, you, know, you deal with that, but you have to have your own heart for the Lord. No one could give that to you. That's something that you have on your own. And as much as every parent may wish that they could force it on their kids, because you want your children, I want my children all to have a heart for the Lord. You can't, you can't force that. Everyone has to have their own. And, you know, we see it actually quite a bit where people rely on other people's spirituality, on other people's, you know, what they've done to kind of apply to themselves. I mean, how many times when you go out soul winning, have you talked to someone who, oh yeah, my dad's a preacher or my mom's a preacher or my uncle or my granddaddy or whoever, right? Like they think that they're okay. They think that they're saved. Oh, because they're this pastor. They're a minister. They're a priest or whatever the story is. And they just kind of 
just rely on what some other people are doing and their spirituality, but it's like, no, I'm asking you. Where's your faith? Why are you saved? Is it because your brother is a, a pastor? You know, and children, you know, I could even ask my children, you know, you're not saved because, because your dad's a pastor. And as much as, you know, I want to see my children, you want to see your children, everyone needs to have their own heart for the Lord. And you need to come to that on your own, but just don't forget, kids, that God knows your heart and He knows your thoughts and you can't rely on anyone else but your own heart and your own relationship with Him. So, um, Matthew 15, and, you know, and the last part there of, uh, of the advice given to Solomon by David, he says, if thou seek Him, He'll be found of thee. If you seek the Lord, he'll, he'll, you'll, you'll, you'll find him. Amen. You will. If you're honest, you're sincere, you want to you seek God, you want to have a relationship with him, he will be found. You will find him. Now the other side of God understanding and searching the hearts and the imaginations, he knows your intent, he knows whether or not you're faking it, but not just that, he knows the wickedness that comes out of people that stems from the heart too. You're in Matthew 15, look at verse number 18. The Bible reads, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. And the fact that God sees the heart, the heart is just like the center of, of everything that comes from a person. Right? Even your thoughts, the Bible teaches, comes from your heart. So, the Bible says in verse 19 there, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Right? Now, obviously, this is, when the Bible, it's, it's not literally talking about an organ. Right? We know the heart's in the center of our body. I don't think this is referring to the distinction between a brain and a heart. This, is, this, this goes more to just who you are. The Bible refers to it as your heart. And, and many people today, even outside the Bible, would refer to pretty much the same thing. What's the heart of a person? Where is your heart? Your heart will drive your thoughts. If you have a heart for the Lord, and, and that's why God seeks and understands and searches the hearts. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, all these bad things can come out of your heart. But good things can come out of your heart too, right? And God's going to discern and look at your heart. So don't, uh, don't forget that, that God knows. And that, you know, when you come across our times, don't just fake it. Have a real faith in the Lord. Let's go back to Psalm 44. We're going to wrap things up here at the end of the, the passage. And if you want to get a, get a place in Romans 8, we're going to turn there. And we're going to close out in Romans 8, but Psalm 44, verse 21, again, shall not God search this out, for he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And there's again that reference to being counted as sheep for the slaughter. And that also says a lot that Obviously, we're not faking it, God. I mean, first of all, you search the hearts. You know that we're not um, stretching out our hands to strange gods. I mean, we're being killed for your name's sake. We're being slaughtered for you. And you know, that does speak volumes to the faithfulness of an individual when you're willing to die for your belief. And that's another testimony to the truthfulness of even Jesus Christ's existence, his death, his resurrection, you know, because there's so many people that want to say, oh, Christianity is a fraud. Right? There's people that will throw out the lies and the slander and they want to say, oh, they were just trying to get a following, just like some other false prophets, right? They'll say Jesus was just another in a line of people 
who's trying to deceive the people for their own gain and everything else. And that his disciples, it's all big hoax, the resurrection. They came and they took the body. And, and people who will believe the lies that the soldiers told that, oh, we fell asleep and they came and stole the body and that's why he's not in the grave and all this stuff. But people just want to explain it away because they hate the Lord. They hate Jesus Christ. They can't accept that he did this. So, but how the, that easily gets destroyed, they say, okay, if they were just in it for gain, look at what they all went through and look at how they all died and what were they left with they didn't gain anything. Right. Like the Apostle Paul said, you know, if, if all we have, and I'm paraphrasing, if all we have is this life, we're of all men most miserable. Right? Like, like if this is all, the best we have to offer, is this is all there's going to be, then of everybody on the earth, we're the most miserable <laughs> because we're going through these really horrible things and we're not trying to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season either. Right? So it's one thing you can at least try to get some type of gratification and lustly pleasures and whatever in this world. Like if that's all there was, then hey, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And if there really isn't anything else, then man, what are we doing? But obviously we know that there's something else. We know that there's an end. We know that there's rewards. We know that there's a heaven. We know that Jesus Christ is real. And the fact that they have and had that even after the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, just, just that devotion, the, the undying devotion unto death also proves a lot. It speaks volumes to the truthfulness of what really happened and what they say. They're committed. They're committed to it. Verse 23, Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. So that's how this psalm ends, is just still calling on the Lord, right? Looking to the Lord to help, to save, to deliver. But what I love about what we're going to find this reference in Romans 8 I think ties everything up really nicely and gives us the extra assurance that you may not find completely in Psalm 44. Romans 8.35 is where we're going to start reading. Because I think, I think this is the point, and it's going to be summarized in, in Romans 8, to what we're seeing in Psalm 44, that even though you, do, you can face these hard times and these, and these persecutions, look at what Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? All these bad things. You have all these bad things happening to you, whether it be famine, you're going without food, you're in distress, you're being persecuted, you know, you're without clothing, there's, you know, sword, there's people physically harming you, you know, can any of these separate us from the love of Christ? That's what we're reading about in Psalm 44. Where are you, God? Right? All these bad things are happening to us. Verse 36, as it is written, so he's, he's referencing this verse in Psalm 44, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But then verse 37 gives the answer, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's the answer. Can any of these things separate us from the love of, from the love of Christ? The answer is no. No matter what you're going through, you're not separated from God's love. You're born again. You're a child of God. You're not separated from God's love. And in fact, going through those things, you're more than conquerors. You're at, you know, it's like, wait a minute, how am I winning? I'm being defeated. No, you're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Nothing, nothing that you go through is going to separate you from God's love. You may not feel it at the moment, but you are not separated from his love. And he will make you make sure that you know that in the end. And you'll experience that in the end. Just have the faith in the meantime to make it to the end. To get through, to get through the tribulation. Hold fast that faith. Don't faint. Keep faithful to the end. You say, what, um, what is, keep faithful to me and, you know, and I'll give thee a crown of life. Faithful unto death and I'll give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2 or 3, I forget where, where that was. Be thou faithful unto death and I'll give thee a crown of life. Hard times do not mean that God's love is not there. It is. You may go through the, the patch for a season. Hey, Jesus Christ went through really difficult times. Job went through really difficult times. But you know what? God was still there. Wait on him. Wait on his timing. There can be a lot more involved than you realize. Because let's face it, you know, if you have the right attitude, you know life's not all about you. It's not all about you. It shouldn't be. Hopefully it's not to you. Just all about you. There's a lot of other people in this world. There's a lot of souls that need to be saved. There's a lot of people that need to be reached. We should be living for them and living for the Lord. And know, hey, God hasn't, God hasn't taken his love from you. Nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing can. That's some good news. And when you have that perspective, even when we're reading through the Psalms, you can see why, yeah, even though we might go through the times where it seems like he's not there, we can have the confidence. You know we're not going to leave you, God. You know we're not going to go and serve other gods. You know our hearts. Search out my heart. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You know, we might as well count ourselves that way. Don't hold your life precious to yourself. Be willing to give it for the Lord. He was willing to give his life for you. Right? This is how we ought to be viewing our existence here. Go ahead. I'm not going to hold back my life to stop the cause of Christ. I'm not going to be that selfish. Count it as sheep for the slaughter. It may happen. And you know what? If we, if we make it to the tribulation, it will happen. So count on it. That is, that is going to happen. Don't know the timing on it right now, but that will happen. So let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great encouragement that we can receive from your word. And I pray that you would please help us all to, to have good faith and to retain our, our faith and our integrity in you, dear Lord, and not to um, unjustly judge a person who's going through real difficult times and ha may have some tragedies happen or may um, be experiencing defeat, short-term defeat from the enemy, Lord, but that um, we'd be able to encourage those and, and also be able to um, keep our faith in you. And I pray that you please help us to look out for one another and, and be encouragement unto one another, Lord, to, um, to get through the rough, rough periods and the rough times. God, we love you, and I pray that you would just continue to, to open up our understanding and open up our hearts and help us to, have, um, to live selflessly and not selfishly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.